All right, guys, it's it's four o'clock and I figured we should get started here. So I wanted to make sure that folks have the ability uh, to join us, but this, this is being recorded. We'll be able to share this later. Anyone who uh, has to drop off can watch the rest of it later. And anybody who wants to, uh, who joins us <laughs> later uh, can always access those recordings as well. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us uh, for our webinar. I'm uh, from uh, News Omatic. This is called Diversifying Nonfiction and the fierce urgency of now. So let me actually uh, introduce our team here, uh, our, our, our hosts. Um, I'm gonna begin uh, by uh, introducing Kim. So uh, Kim is the coordinator of elementary social studies for the Howard County Public School System. Uh, Kim began as a fifth grade elementary school teacher and she's worked on the elementary civics NAEP assessment, taught as an adjunct professor and helped to review the National C3 Standards. Kim is currently on the board for the National Social Studies Supervisors Association and is serving as the past president for the Maryland Council for Social Studies, past president of the Asian American Educators of Howard County, president-elect for her children's PTA, and finishing her dissertation for a PhD. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Kim. It's my pleasure. And now it's my turn to introduce um, Russ to you. Russ is the Chief Content and Educational Officer at Newsomatic. He studied print journalism at Boston University and elementary education at Montclair Saint State University. Russell was the Director of K-12 Content Development for the Princeton Review and has developed educational materials for companies such as Weekly Reader, Triumph Learning, Standard Solutions, and Core K-12. Russell also authored more than 10 books for students and educators, including guides to the Common Core, Praxis, and Career Readiness in Middle School. Thank you, Russ, for giving me this opportunity to join you today. So, so thrilled to be here together with you, Kim. So um, I guess I'll let you kick it off here and talk about what it is we're doing here. And, and I should know today is February 15th, so uh, right in the middle here of uh, Black History Month. Yep. And so with that being the case, we're going to start out with a very appropriate quote that you can see here. Um, go ahead and I'll let you read that to yourself. So as we know, on August 28th in 1963, it was at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. It was in that speech that Dr. King made a clarion call for racial and social justice. The phrase, the fierce urgency of now is not only bold, but prophetic. It is a call not just for the 1960s, but one for us today. And that is the reason we are uplifting it with the title of our presentation. So let's start out with a question. What does diversity mean to you? I want you to think about that question though, as we proceed through this presentation, we'll come back to it at the end when you, so that you have a, plenty of time to think about that. Moving on, we have a little video that we'd like to share with you. Um, it's, if the world were a village of a hundred people, you've probably read that book when you were a kid. This is an update to it um, from 2022. Now that we have 8 billion people with us on this planet, it's nice to see how um, some of those stat statistics have changed. Yeah. And of course, we did a story about hitting the 8 billion population. Um, but let me go ahead and play this video for you. Thank you for um, um, bearing with us and uh, enjoy this. No, we're only going to play about a minute or two of it, but let's. I want to play this out loud for everybody here. In 2022, there are 8 billion people in the world today. But what if we reduce the Earth to a village of 100 people? 58 out of 100 are Asian, 19 are African, 12 are North and South American, 10 are European, the other one is from Oceania. Among them, 18 are Chinese and 4 are American. In 1990, there were 66 people in this village, and now the population is growing rapidly. The number will increase by one next year. It will be 108 by 2030. People use many languages to communicate. 16 people speak Chinese. 14 people speak 
English, eight in Hindi, seven in Spanish. Three people speak Arabic. Another three people speak Bengali. The remaining 49 speak Portuguese, Indonesian, Japanese, German, French, and so on. 51 are male, 49 are female, 15 are disabled. 24 children under the age of 15 live there. Four people aged 75 and over live there. The average age of this village is 31 years. Average life expectancy is 75 years. Religions are also diverse. 31 Christians, 23 Muslims, 15 Hindus, 7 Buddhists, 6 folk religions, and 16 people are not religious. In 2020. So we'll, we'll stop it uh, there, but I think it's a really curious and a beautiful way to see all the different ways that uh, humanity is represented across planet Earth. Thank you, Kim, for finding that video and making sure we all took a minute and 40 or so seconds uh, to enjoy. So when we are thinking about all the people on this planet and we're thinking about that word diversity, I want us to think outside the box and not just focus on race necessarily. Think about gender identity, religion, culture, socioeconomics, age, people with different abilities and disabilities, education levels, and even people who are introverts versus extroverts. Many of us that are teachers are extroverts by nature. And so we sometimes overlook the fact that we have introverted students in our classroom who want to share, but might be reluctant to, and we have to figure out new ways to do that for them and to uplift them without putting them on the spot. So now I have a little cartoon for you to take a look at. And you may remember this um, quote that came um, from um, Mirrors, Windows, and Sliding Doors and Perspectives by Rudin Sims Bishop. And so the idea being that with mirrors, they allow us to see ourselves represented in a story. They allow us to explore our own identity. Mirrors also can help validate a reader's belief in their own importance. And it reaffirms the value of everybody in the community. Whereas windows, they're gonna bring visibility to cultures that are different from ours. Not just marginalized children, but um, they can also help others be exposed to the diverse books. They can help us change our attitudes and see differences. They help us see bullying or injustice through a new perspective. And they help us to learn something new together and they can unite us despite any differences that we may have. With that in mind, the quote, the actual quote reads, books are sometimes windows, offering views of worlds that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and readers have only to walk through in imagination to become part of whatever world has been created or recreated by the author. And when the lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. And that's by Rudine Sims Bishop. So now the big question becomes, why do we need more diverse books? Well, first off, we know that um, diverse books are going to help bring empathy and understanding, right? They're going to help us flow um, over into having a difficult discussion later at home or into a classroom. They'll help us emphasize similarities, the idea that kids are kids, no matter what and no matter how different their backgrounds are. So that empathy and understanding is clutch when we read diverse books and text. Second, Diverse books are going to help us increase our authenticity and accuracy of history, both today and in the past. So with the infusing um, diverse texts into our regular curriculum of all subject areas, not just history, um, we're going to be helping with our accuracy. The other thing is, for authenticity purposes, we don't want to save these diverse texts for just a special month. Um, we know that we are in Black History Month which is wonderful, but that doesn't mean that we have to relegate our um, African-American texts and stories to just the month of February. We want to be using them throughout the school year as appropriate. And that goes for all of our texts. 
And last but not least, we need diverse books because we live in a global world. Just like that video brings it um, to the forefront for us, that our global citizens, um, they need to be aware of what is happening in the current events. We have a bunch of little sponges in our classrooms. They are so curious. They want to know what's happening in their world. For better or for worse, social media is here to stay. And our students, whether they're 13 or not, we know they're not supposed to be on social media yet, but they are. They're paying attention. And so we know that we need to ready our students for the larger discussion, and we need to make sure that they are able to do that in a safe space. Speaking of which, Beautifully said, Kim. Thank you so much. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more about the need for diversity in, in books, certainly. Uh, but we also need diversity in all texts um, that we're looking at. And that includes, naturally, news articles such as those you might find in a product called Newsomatic. So, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier, yes, it's, it's Black History Month. We do um, certainly have a lot of content uh, around Black History Month that you might see. This is our edition from uh, this year, Feb 1st. We did a uh, themed edition where each of the articles in the given day uh, covered different aspects of Black history. I'm incredibly proud of each of those individual articles. For example, in the education article, we interviewed Melba Beals. She uh, was a member of the Little Rock Nine. Uh, she was some, the class in Arkansas that helped integrate the school in Little Rock, Arkansas, I believe in the 1950s. Pretty amazing to speak with people who have lived through this and can share their stories, share their perspectives. That's really uh, critical to what we're trying to do here day in and day out. Um, so yeah, of course, we've got historical stories, but we're also a newspaper and we try to bring history to life. And one way we did that this month is we covered um, the day it opened, actually, the uh, Embrace. Uh, that is the new gigantic sculpture in Boston, Massachusetts, dedicated to the Embrace shared by Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. And uh, we wanted to make sure kids understood that and how it relates to history and what that, what that hug, what that Embrace actually represents. Um, and again, it's 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 not just about moments from history. And of course, it's also uh, worth noting that uh, it is Black History Month, but diversity doesn't just mean, um, you know, one particular race and one particular group of people. So I'm really proud of the content that we do uh, around Native Americans. Um, we spoke with this uh, artist who um, does some incredible artwork across the United States. Uh, I spoke to him about the importance of his pieces. Uh, that piece there, uh, which uh, it looks like a bit like a pyramid, um, represents the mound sculptures that the Native American people help create uh, and build in different areas of the United States. And it's, I love those connections, right? You've got art that's kind of mirroring history, mirroring culture, and we're trying to elevate these voices. It's so important to what we do day in and day out. But again, diversity is not simply color of the skin. It's not about just race. It goes so much beyond that. We try to make sure that we represent people of all different backgrounds, people of all different abilities, and different ways of thinking. Uh, we've got Autism Awareness Day coming up April 2nd. Uh, we try to interview, we, you know, in this case, we've interviewed a 13-year-old boy uh, who is uh, on the spectrum, and, and he shared about uh, his experience and about the way his brain works, um, and he just spoke about it. And again, we're elevating his voice. We're elevating their voices. It's so important to make sure that it's not just us uh, speaking to ourselves and, and, and reporting, but we actually want to get those voices out there. Um, and again, you know, this was a, a story a few weeks ago. Um, yes, there was history in the house, uh, which is appropriate for Black History Month with Hakeem Jeffries becoming the first uh, person of color uh, to lead a party in Congress. But also we've got a parastronaut, um, which is um, uh, a disabled person who has been um, welcomed into the astronaut program in the United Kingdom. So again, making sure that students understand the different ways of, of being, frankly. Um, it's about, and, and, and to echo Kim's point earlier, so it's a lot about building empathy. Um, so I'm going to take a, a, a moment here and embarrass myself uh, because we've, we've been doing Newsomatic now day in and day out for, for about 10 years. And for those folks who don't know what we're doing here, we're creating a, a daily news uh, platform for K through eight, different, different reading levels, 
But when we started about 10 years ago, it looked a little bit different, um, but the idea was still the same. We still wanted to give kids five news stories every day. And I wanted to show you uh, a, a cover we did back in 20, end of 2012, and we were beginning of 2013, just as we were starting, one of the first few weeks. Not super proud of the design of this cover, um, but I think you can see the types of stories that we wanted to cover. Um, at that time, he was a mayor, Cory Booker. Of course, now he's a senator in the U.S. Congress. Um, talking, uh, he, you know, he's and I'm actually speaking to you from New Jersey, so well aware. Uh, but we wanted to talk about India uh, and and sport in India, and we wanted to talk about uh, protests in Egypt. And there was a scientific story about the uh, the nose, and that came from Spain. And I got to tell you, I was so proud of myself for this edition. I remember finishing the day and being like, we represented cultures from across the world. We've got South Asia, uh, we've got Africa, we've got that, 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 that scientific story which took place in Spain. And I, you know, it, it speaks to what, what, what Kim was just talking about in terms of creating global citizens. And again, I was patting myself on the back, thinking to myself, what a great job I, I'm doing here. And then the next morning, I got a comment from a teacher who said that she loves Newsomatic, she loves our content, she's happy with our stories, but she would like to see perhaps a, a greater showcase of women making the news. And I looked at the cover and I said, oh gosh, uh, she's completely right. She's completely right. So for me, that was a learning experience. I said, I'm, I'm embarrassing myself, I'm humbling myself a little bit, but it was a learning opportunity. And I'm proud to say where we've come from there. Uh, for example, we always try to, you know, we always cover March Madness, uh, both for men and for women. And we're always uh, spotlighting female leaders. Um, and Michaela Schifrin became uh, the winningest uh, female skier in the history of the World Cup. And so that was our top story when it came out January 24th, a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, of course, we've got, you know, arts and entertainment and fashion and all that, but really excited about all the work that we do to promote incredible women and that is naturally uh, a, a huge part of diversity as well, um, as, as we're now two weeks out from Women's History Month. Um, so I've talked a lot about, about I've talked a lot about how diversity um, appears in Newsomatic in different forms, and we'll continue to work on it day in and day out. But I'm going to um, throw it back to Kim, and, and um, Kim, if you could talk just a little bit about authenticity, because I think that's that's a branch of diversity, and, and uh, I'd like to hear from you about this. Thanks. Sure. So with authenticity, one of the things um, that we're always striving to do is to make sure that we find text that avoids stereotypes, that avoids exotification, and that avo avoids tokenism. So in doing that, we have to constantly remind ourselves that, you know what? Culture is more than the three Fs. We've all heard them, we've all learned them, and we've got to get past them. So the three Fs are food, fashion, and festivities, right? And they're really fun to learn about, but we can't stop there, right? And so if we're going to truly be authentic, when we learn about different cultures, we have to look at that bigger picture. The other thing that we want to keep in mind is the diaspora between cultures and within cultures. So it's very nuanced. Something um, that somebody once said to me, and I completely agreed, and I never forgot it, was that there's actually more diversity within one culture than there are between cultures, and oftentimes. So I was explaining this to Russ, and I was saying, you know, you and I have very different cultures, probably. I can just look at us and say, there are, we are different races. Um, and so we come from different racial backgrounds. However, my the difference between me, somebody who is Asian and growing up in the United States versus um, in, in a suburb, be it at that, versus somebody who's in South Korea and living in Seoul or Daegu and live in the metropolitan lifestyle, we probably have way more differences in our, between us and our cultural lives day to day, especially than Russ and I do because we're both these um, people living in the United States in these suburb areas. Um, so keeping that in mind, and that's where, especially I think we do a great job of that in elementary of finding the commonalities between us and uplifting our similarities and not just our differences. When we are choosing sources, there are a couple of things that we're going to want to do 
in addition to just avoiding those three Fs, right? The other thing we wanna do is ask ourselves questions so that we can determine, is this a reliable source? Is it something I should believe in? On the screen right now, you see a couple of the different questions that we as historians always use when we're looking at historical text. But if you read those questions to yourself, you'll see these are questions that aren't just good for history. They're not just good for the past. These are great for the present. And they're great for asking ourselves, especially nonfiction text. So with these, I'm gonna to scroll to the next one. Perfect. If you take a look um, on your screen, you'll see this is a snapshot of what one person said looks like when you are trying to determine the reliability and or the bias of a news source. And so what you're seeing on this chart are those on the left side, they've determined to be more liberal in nature, right? Whereas those on the right side, further over, they've determined to be more conservative in nature and those in the middle being more um, even. So that being the case, that's one person's take and that's great. And I said, when I found this chart, I was like, yes, I'm gonna use this all the time so that when I'm presenting controversial issues, I pull something from the left side, something from the right side, something from the middle, and I'll have some balanced sources, yay. But then, go ahead and click for me again, Russ. I found this chart and I went, uh-oh, well, what do I do now? Because it doesn't match, right? And this is where sometimes I have to source my source and I have to ask myself, all right, who created this source in the first point? Just because it looks really reliable doesn't mean it is. And so this is where we get into something called lateral reading, right? Where we're going to be sourcing like as soon as I pull up one of these, so one of these charts happens to be from mediabiaschart.com. Before I use that, I'm going to Google mediabiaschart.com founder or sponsors or um, accuracy. I'm going to start Googling my source itself before I bother really delving into the source itself because it might not be worth my time, right? And so that's something that um, we especially want to do with diverse texts, right? Because there's that saying, um, nothing about us without us. And what it's getting to is the idea that when we're reading texts about diverse cultures, especially those that are not our own, we want to make sure that they are authentic, that they've been written by people with the appropriate knowledge base so that it's not um, oversimplifying or falsely including information that might be offensive to people of that culture. And so now let's show you an example of another news article. So I wanna just take this second here and, and talk a little bit about the, the diversity of sources in news -omatic. I gotta tell you, when people um, meet news meet me and talk about news -omatic, one of the first questions is they ask is, where do you get your information from? Where do you get your sources? Where, you know, and it's an incredibly important question, especially as we're navigating this media literacy crisis that we're all in at this moment. And um, we really need to help guide students through. Um, so. First of all, I should mention that you know we're an original news creator for children. Uh, we try to write original content for for uh, grades K through eight. But with something like the earthquake that just uh, struck in Turkey and Syria, we don't have the ability to be on the ground. We don't have the ability to report with our own eyes. So we, of course, are using other sources, and we're proud to say that we are transparent about where all of our sources come from. So we, we want to be clear about all the pictures and the videos, and we also want to cite, uh, we use MLA citations, and you can see exactly where the information is coming from. This is so critical uh, for students as they're learning how to uh, decipher information and, and to understand um, the sources, um, but it's also, you can see the types of diversity that we're trying to get in, 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 in through our own sources. Um, for example, you know, we're, we're speaking to you from the United States, but there's a bigger world out there. So it's really important for me and for our team of journalists to use 
global news sources. So here on this on the sources for this particular article, you can see yes, we've got uh, Reuters, Associated Press, NPR, the United Nations, but also Al Jazeera and BBC. Um, perspectives may change across countries' uh, borders, and uh, different nations may see uh, one event different in the ways, and and it's really just critical that that if we're going to be sharing this information for kids that uh, we get a global perspective as well. Um, I do want to reinforce the fact that we do original reporting and we do so many, many interviews uh, every week, speak to people all around the world. Uh, in fact, going back to the United Nations, we celebrated the UN 75th anniversary by doing a 193 part series called Countries A to Z from uh, Afghanistan through Zimbabwe. And what we made sure to do is um, we wanted to speak to people in these countries. So um, it's pretty neat when you're doing an article, you know, you're reading a text about one of these countries and you're actually seeing a real person there. You're hearing their voice. They're telling you what it means to be from that country. Um, again, this is not a Wikipedia story. This is not um, just a plain old encyclopedia. We're trying to, um, you know, bridge uh, cultures and help kids uh, realize the different people all around the world, how they live, but also uh, to echo at Kim's point earlier, we are alike in, in a lot of ways, even if we wear different clothes, even if we have different skin tones, even if um, I, I, I like the three Fs. I hadn't actually heard that before, Kim, but um, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, you know, food, fashion, and uh, the festivities, it's an easy way to understand a culture, um, but we want to go, you know, deeper. We want kids to connect um, with the real people all around the world, um, and, and we're going to keep doing that day in and, and day out. Um, so I'm going to uh, kick it back to you, Kim, so um, you can, I know there's a quote that you wanted to share. Yeah, I love those examples, though, and I was just thinking um, Montenegro is not a country we usually uplift. We tend to stick to the Eastern European um, countries, right? So looking at something that's um, in the south of Europe is a nice change of pace. And I was just thinking if I was a kid and I finally saw, you know, my country up there, how that would affect me, right? And in that vein, let's take a look at this quote. A book can show you the world. It can also show you a reflection of yourself. But what happens when you never see anyone in a book like you? And so this reminds me that we need to go back to those books um, that are windows into reality. They're not just imaginary words. Nonfiction text, as um, we, we've been talking about, is what our students need in order to have those windows into reality that Rudine Sims Bishop talked about. And so now we've um, been talking to you about all these different great ideas of like, go get diverse texts. You can find some here um, that was just shared from Newsomatic, but you can also find them all over the place. The thing is, as teachers, sometimes I'm like, I would love to do that, but I can not buy one more book for my classroom library without being yelled at by my spouse, right? Because... I'm spending all of my income on my classroom library. Well, good news for you. We're going to highlight right now two different ways that you can go and get some um, books for your classroom and have it not come out of your own paycheck. So there's one, it's called the Chris, Chris, Krista McAuliffe Award. It's awarded through the National Center for Social Studies, and it's up to $2,500 free. I will tell you, in, this is like insider information kind of. People haven't been applying for this award. Like very few people are applying. It is not hard to get this award right now. But as you can see, I have a big mouth. I found out about it and now I'm telling the world. So um, act fast. Hopefully you'll be one of those people this year that gets it before I get to tell too many people about this award. Because I think it's just a phenomenal opportunity to be able to really grow a diverse book set in my classroom. The other one is diversebooks.org. We've all heard of them. They actually have a program too where they have grants and you can get $1,500 to $2,000 in diverse books. And diversebooks.org is a great place to go to find just book list after book list after book list about just about any kind of culture you can imagine. It's 
fabulous. I strongly recommend going there. There are a ton of other places. Um, before we leave today, we will share our email addresses with you. If you are looking for diverse book lists, um, you can email either of us. I can tell you I have a ton of them at my fingertips that I'm always happy to share. Um, but now that you know, okay, we need diverse books. We've talked about all the whys. We've just talked about how you can probably get some diverse books. But what are you going to do about it besides just apply for one of these grants? Hopefully you'll get it. But what else can be done? Well, Russ is going to talk about what he's been doing with his company. Yeah, thanks, Kim. I think it's so important to leave this webinar with some action points. And, um, you know, we've, I, I, you know, as, as, as I'm, a little bit embarrassed to show you, you know, we've come a long way in 10 years and, and, uh, but it doesn't mean that we're done. It doesn't mean that we've, okay, now we're, we're diverse and, and that's it. Like this is a, we have to sort of ask the tough questions every day, every day we have to look at our product and say, you know, are, are, are we doing enough? And so with that said, I wanted to share with everybody here, um, a checklist that I've got printed out and keep on my desk. And uh, it's it's part of our, it's page one of our editorial guidelines so that we can, every member of our team, all of our journalists, all of our editors um, can can ask, ask the tough questions that, that we need to be asking with every article we publish every single day. For the record, we've now done over 13,000 original articles uh, dating back to those early days in, about 10 years ago. But I'm going to read these out loud. I know you, you've got them here, but I, I when we do an article, when we do an edition, we have to ask ourselves, is every sentence in the story free from bias, including regional, cultural, gender, racial, and socioeconomic bias? Um, quick example, I used to work at the Princeton Review. I know you mentioned that earlier, Kim. I remember we would read test prep questions. You're talking about a math problem, volume. And one of the easy ways to calculate volume of a rectangular prism is by calculating the volume of a pool. Seems like an easy thing to just say, okay, pool is three feet deep, six feet long. But it's actually an easier problem if you have a pool. You can visualize it. It's there are there are ways that bias is embedded in our culture that we have to be really critical about. Um, and I think about that pool example a lot, right? I mean, even the early SATs, you have a question like sailboat is to regatta, as you know, they when have the analogies. So you know, it's again, it's built in in a lot of ways, and and we have to work hard every single day to undo uh, those biases. Does this article avoid perpetuating a negative stereotype? Simple, but you have to ask that out loud. Will students from various backgrounds feel that this article is fair to their experiences? Does this story lean into positive and rich aspects of culture? Um, I know you mentioned earlier, Kim, that uh, you know we 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 cover our uh, countries that may not be covered very often. I mean, yes, Montenegro, but we covered uh, Zimbabwe, you know, every every country uh, across Africa. And, you know, I think the U.S. media does a pretty poor job of highlighting good news, uh, positive uh, from from Africa and, and, and other parts of the world. So we we really try to lean into that from Newsomatic. Does this story provide educational opportunities for students to gain insight into another group of people? Again, we're not trying to perpetuate stereotypes here. And this is an important point to what we do because we're such a multimedia product for students. Do the visuals, images, and video portray a group of people in an inoffensive and accurate way? Uh, you can write a text that is free from bias, but a photograph can actually cause harm as well, and it can perpetuate negative stereotypes. We don't want to do that. That has to be part of our question uh, that we ask, one of the questions that we ask ourselves as well. And then lastly, will this story be considered fair to every student and educator? So if we don't, if we can't check all those boxes, then we have to look back at our article, look back at our text before we publish. Um, and I just wanted to share this because this is, a, you know, part of our process day in and day out, but we're continuing to evolve. We're continuing to strive to do better every single day. And if there are ways that that we can improve, that I can improve at Newsomatic, Please let me know. Uh, you'll get my you'll get you know my personal email in a moment here. Um, but um, I hope that you can take some of these points with you and, and integrate that into your day to day, whatever uh, your job is, and wherever in the in the world you happen to live. Um, and so then we leave you with this question for yourself: What does this all mean for you? 
Going back to that quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, this is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. So we ask you to please go find those diverse texts and read them widely and wisely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Right now, Russ is gonna throw our personal emails up there. I can tell you there is nothing I love more than responding to other teachers to help improve our education for our future. Um, I think that's the social studies teacher in me, you know, forever and always. So please don't be a stranger. Whatever we can do to help you, let us know. If you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand now and we'll get to them. And again, you've got our emails just to make sure you have it there going back. It's uh, kmegborn at gmail.com and I'm russ at newsomatic.org. Love to hear from you. If there's anything that I can do, um, you know, to, to, to help promote diversity uh, in the text that we create at Newsomatic, let me know. Uh, I think you can tell, I hope you can tell that how much this, this matters personally to me, but on behalf of my entire team and company at Newsomatic, it's uh, critically important to what we do. It's fundamental to our mission. And Kim, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and speaking to your perspective um, regarding diversity in nonfiction texts. My pleasure.